Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. Welcome to Women's Hoops and Talks, the What Podcast, where we are elevating the voice of women in basketball. I'm Tara. And I'm Cassidy. Thank you so much for listening today. We've got a great show coming up. We're going to talk to Marilyn Davinsky of Pounding the Rock, which is the SB Nation site all about the San Antonio Spurs. We're going to ask her about what is next for Greg Popovich, check in on LaMarcus Aldridge, and find out what to watch for when the Blazers play the Spurs this weekend. Uh, Before we introduce our guests, let me remind everyone that they can follow the Hoops and Talks podcast on Twitter at Hoops and Talks, and you can subscribe to the show in the Blazers Edge podcast feed on whatever platform you use to get your podcasts. Well, ladies, let's get started. And Cassidy, do you have an icebreaker for us tonight? I do. Um, Because Tara and I frequently, when we talk about the Spurs, we talk about vampires, which got me thinking about zombies. So... If the zombie apocalypse is coming and you need to pick three NBA players, past or present, to help join your survival team, who do you pick? Shall we ask if the guest would like to start, or would you like to have one of us go first? (laughs) That is up to (laughs) (laughs) y'all. Okay, well, I'll go first. Um, So my team for the zombie apocalypse is Shaq. Obviously, because he is the biggest person that I could possibly think of. Uh, so I can hide behind and feel safe that way. Um, I would also choose Rajon Rondo because although I do not like it when my teams play his teams, um, I feel like he is super smart and uh, could really be helpful in getting us out of tight situations. And then because I would want to have somebody from home um, and because I like would fight with him till the end, I would take Damian Lillard. So Shaq, Rondo, and Lillard are my zombie apocalypse team. I like it. I like it. I think Shaq is an easy pick for sure. Um, Shaq was definitely on my team. Uh, But I'm going with Shaq because of pure size. I'm going with Nurkic because I feel like Nurkic could take down some zombies. Oh, that's a good pick. And lastly, a former player player that played for the Blazers for one month and five days um, or six days, I think. Uh, Adam Morrison, who actually has an entire survival bunker built in his house and he is a survival like fanatic and he's convinced this is all going to happen. So I'd want him on my team. That seems like a super smart pick. (laughs) Okay, Marilyn, how about you? Who's on your zombie apocalypse survival team? Well, I feel like my thoughts are kind of right in the middle y'all i considered Shaq, but ultimately settled on carl the elbow malone love it another guy who would punch anyone out for you if you needed a last line of defense and i kind of i had to have a spur i kind of juggled between tim duncan who is a real example of a living zombie (laughs) and (laughs) robinson but ultimately chose david robinson because he's just the nicest guy on the planet super smart he used to spend his spare time taking apart and rebuilding computers he could help us get it back together nice and sticking with the smart theme i would take the harvard educated jeremy lynn who has a degree in economics that can help us start rebuilding oh that's those so are smart. great picks i like those I think we've all chosen really, really well. So let's make a plan (laughs) for how we can get together with our teams. We could all meet at Adam Morrison's bunker with our other team members. How's that? (laughs) That sounds great. That's like a good plan. That bunker seems real safe. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you for uh, getting started like that. Let's go ahead and jump in and ask Marilyn. Um, Let's see. Um. So, Marilyn, if you could start off by introducing yourself and tell us about your relationship with basketball. How did you get into basketball? Uh, no problem. Well, uh, like y'all said, I currently 
right for pounding the rocks. I'm a Spurs fan. I was born and raised in San Antonio. The only time I lived anywhere else was when I was at Texas A&M University, where I got a degree in spatial science, and I'm currently using that degree as a GIS analyst. And uh, I grew up mostly playing soccer and basketball equally, but when my height kind of capped out at five foot three, I decided soccer was my sport, but I continued to love basketball. And uh, like David Robinson was my idol growing up in the 90s. I used to love going to my grandmother's house and watching the Spurs with her when I was little, just because she'd get so into it and so intense. I was more watching her than the Spurs, (laughs) but she still got me into it. And um, I don't I don't want y'all to take offense at this, but I have to say my favorite Spurs memory of all time is the Memorial Day miracle from Sean Elliott in 1999. Uh, it hurts. That, that's the season I really started watching them religiously, but it's just, it's just my first big Spurs memory. But there are plenty other good ones. It feels like a lot of people have a favorite memory of their own team doing something against the Blazers. <laughs> yep. It's a popular <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. That should be a compliment. Y'all are hard to beat. Yeah. You'd yeah. think, but when I hear it, it's always like, I remember when the Blazers blew this lead and then we won the game. <laughs> See, it's it's like any a- consolation. I hear about that with the Spurs all the time. And I feel like whenever I see highlights on Twitter, someone's like, oh, look what this player did against the Spurs 20 years ago. And it, I feel you. <laughs> I know what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been writing for uh, the um, Pounding the Rock? Um, I've been writing for Pounding the Rock for three years. This is my third full season covering them. And before that, I had a little bit of sports writing experience. I helped cover the Spurs for Bleacher Report back during the 2010-2011 season when it was still mostly fan-operated. And the best part about that was that was the year of Manu Ginobili. So, of course, aside from the first round upset to the Grizzlies, it was an amazing season to cover. Have have you, um, like, how has writing or covering the team enhanced your enjoyment of the game, or has it? I think it has. It, it's made me pay a lot more attention to detail. Like, I used to kind of be a whiff about it. if a game wouldn't go in the way I wanted to, I would mute it or turn it off for a little while and come back. But when I'm actually covering the game for the site and have to have an article up within 10 minutes or so after it's over, I have to actually pay attention and see what's going on, make observation. And it's, it's given me a whole new respect and understanding for the game while also uh, making me less sensitive to losses. I can take it better now. I, I understand it more. I got one more question before we move on. And you referenced uh, watching the game with your grandma. And I have heard so many people, men and women alike, talk about uh, watching their grandparents uh, watch the game. And I don't know, you know, if it's just, you know, an age group thing or whatever. But what are some of the, you know, fond memories you have of watching the games with your grandma? Like, what was she like? You said it sounds like she was really into the games. She was. I mean, when the game went on, she's just the nicest, most loving person I ever knew. But when the game was on, she was like, oh, come on, pass the ball, <laughs> and went from this nice, proper city lady to her Texas accent coming out, and it was just so much fun. We we had so much fun being with her and watching the games and watching her get mad and, and happy with everything that went right. It was just a lot of fun. That's awesome. Love it. So we've been hearing a lot of talk about Popovich lately, and we're wondering what the discussion is like in San Antonio and how much longer you think Pop is going to be around to coach the Spurs. Because I know he'll always be around as a figure for them, but for the coaching role. I think for the most part, no one really knows and everyone kind of accepts that. Mm-hmm. One thing Pop does enjoy doing is kind of trolling the media when they ask him about it. It'll be like, yeah. you know, so how much longer do you think you're in a coach? Do you think you're in a coach of Spurs next year? And he just goes, I don't know. And then they <laughs> run away with that. Oh, Pop might retire next year. And he has mm-hmm. a laugh about it and then sets the record straight that, no, I really don't know. It could be next year. It could be in 10 years. Yeah. One thing a lot of people seem to want to use as a measuring 
stick is next summer he will be the Team USA coach in the uh, 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Uh And everyone seems to want want to think, okay, he'll coach through that and then retire, or maybe he'll do one more year after that. The, if I had to guess his contract expires next summer, I can see him signing another two to five year contract and coaching any number of those to all the way through, Mm -hmm. if not beyond. I think as Spurs fans, we just, we understand that the time will come eventually and we appreciate every minute we have with him and, just know not to take what the media says about it too seriously because yeah. they're just getting trolled by Pop. Yeah, I don't think he's, I don't, I think he's one, he's going to be like, when he retires, it's going to be like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm retiring. And then it's just like, that's the end of the discussion with him. But I I just love watching Pop in general. So I do hope to watch him coach a few more years. Um, I think he will. So, yeah. So the last few years have kind of been a transitional time for the Spurs with longtime Spurs, Duncan, Ginobili, and Parker all leaving. What kind of has that transition been like? Uh, It actually hasn't been as hard as I always feared it would be. In a weird sense, Tim Duncan is probably the easiest to transition from just because we had LaMarcus Aldridge on board and um, it was, it's been a little harder this year losing both Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili at once. And then at the same time, they weren't even the biggest losses the last year's roster. But um, t- like last season, Tony had really taken a step back after his hamstring tear in the 2017 playoffs. And he really wanted to get back and help as soon as possible with all the other injury problems and probably came back too soon. He, eventually just hit a wall and couldn't do anymore. And that's when uh, Pop decided it was time to go with DeJounte Murray. And um, that was, that kind of pushed Tony Parker back to the third string role behind Patty Mills. Mm -hmm. And they had the exact same offer for him this summer that the uh, Charlotte Hornets did. The main thing the Hornets had to offer him that the Spurs didn't was playing time. And we were all very sad to see Tony go, but I think everyone completely understands that the Spurs are, are, have just gotten younger at the guard spot. And in, in a way, it's a good situation for Tony. He's playing for his idol and Michael Jordan. He, the head coach is a former Spurs assistant, James Borrego. Mm-hmm. He has his French teammate and former Blazer, Nicholas Patum there. So it's working out well for him and we're all happy for him. I, He's kind of missed just because of all the injury issues the Spurs have had at guard this year, but it has been good for the young guys to get minutes. And with Manu, he's he's actually kind of been the hardest to adjust to not having a round just because he was such a team leader and his performances in the clutch and just, you know, having no conscience – has really been missed. The Spurs have struggled at times in the clutch this season, especially with ball handling, decision-making. And so replacing his play on the court has been much more of a group effort by the Spurs bench, which again has been a very good unit this year. But with the leadership, Patty Mills has stepped into the role. Well, he's the longest tenured Spur now, believe it or not. And the, only player besides Marco Bellinelli who re-signed with the Spurs this season that was on that 2014 championship team. So it truly is a new team, but if you asked me five years ago where the Spurs would be once the big three were gone, I would have told you a whole lot worse off than this. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it's been a a pretty good transition, and I feel like that is a big testament to the organization itself because I feel like they've done it really, really well. Um, so besides the play on the court, is there something you miss the most about all of those guys being gone? Uh, this will sound silly, but, and I've mentioned it in my writing before. One thing that was always so funny was Tim Duncan would harass Sean Elliott before the games when they were doing the <laughs> pregame. He'd come and push him out of his chair, rub his head, and those those just funny moments are, are missing now with him and... Um, you know, there's still a very good team camaraderie this season with these Spurs, but I mean, there is ultimately something like eight or nine new players on the team. So they're, they're building it, but the 
it's not as much of a cohesive group as we're used to seeing, but I, th- I think that will come with time. This group gets along very well. We we saved the the big one for last, and that is what has it been like without Kawhi? That's been the biggest loss of the season for sure. In a way, it's if you just think about last season, it's kind of a relief that he's gone. That all got very dramatic. Mm-hmm. It, you know, no one's entirely sure how hurt he actually was, how much of a role his uncle has played in all this. You know, it's been said that his uncle has LeBron James like aspirations. He wants to start his own marketing company for athletes, but he's not a player agent. So he had to find other ways around it. And, you know, all I was just think his uncle kind of helped convince him to make his way to a bigger market. And this was how they went about it. But it, obviously the, Biggest loss on the court from Kawhi has been the defense. Like the Spurs are, I think, 20th in defense right now, which is not territory we're used to being under Greg Popovich. But that, you know, that also is part of losing Danny Green and Kyle Anderson uh, last summer. And again, it's just all rebuilding from the bottom up. But you wouldn't have thought we'd be in a playoff position under most circumstances. So it's still a testament to this team. So this may seem weird, but I am mildly, if not mildly, like super obsessed with the Spurs H-E-B commercials, which for those of our viewers or our listeners that don't know, they are the uh, local like uh, grocery store commercials or like, I, I guess you should be explaining that because I have never seen them on TV, but I am definitely obsessed and I'm wondering if fans love them as much as I do. <laughs> Uh, the Spurs fans look forward to them coming out every single year. They are definitely hilarious. I mean, that would be another thing I'd add on to where we definitely missed the big three a lot. You couldn't quite match the chemistry those three had on the set, but they're still hilarious mm-hmm. every year. LaMarcus well, Aldridge is actually pretty good in them. The funniest part is when they release the bloopers and Aldridge is the one who can never keep his composure on set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love them. I have seen every single one of them, um, I think, ever. I, I sometimes just binge watch them in my free time. Um, but I feel like DeMar DeRozan has done a pretty good job this year, in the especially the taco ads. Yeah, those were – he's done a good job. He fit right in. Rudy Gay is good. And, of course, Patty Mills is good. He's I mean, hilarious. <laughs> Patty is amazing, always. <laughs> he is. He's one of the favorite Spurs of all time over here. Wait, can you guys give like maybe a describe, you know, your favorite ones or what your, you know, some some oh, examples <laughs> or just examples of ones that you can remember of all the ones you've watched? I've watched a few of them, like where they I think they like show up, showed up at a picnic and they each brought like a different item that they bought at the store or something like that. <laughs> there, there's one from last year that is actually now. Ironically symbolic because I don't remember what foods they were talking about, but they were all in a plane getting ready to skydive. And at the end, Tony Parker pushes Kawhi Leonard out of the plane. (laughs) That one is now hilariously symbolic. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) That's amazing. That took a turn. (laughs) I always love the ones that feature David Robinson. Uh, just because I grew up watching him because we share a birthday. So I was like oddly obsessed with that as a kid. And um, I feel like there's some good Legends ones where they're like bringing him all their favorite things from H-E-B to David Robinson. He's like talking about them. Yeah, and they're like the the Legacy Club. And now Tim Duncan is Mm -hmm. in the commercials. Manu joined this year, and I'm sure someday Tony Parker will join again. Are a lot of those guys still hanging, are still in San Antonio? Oh, definitely. David Robinson still lives in San Antonio. You can find him a lot of places. Funny story with George Gervin. I mean, he's everywhere in San Antonio. He and my dad actually used to be workout buddies at the same gym, and they lived blocks apart back in the 70s. And and he still remembers my dad. And maybe once every year or two, we run into him, and he remembers his nickname for my dad which was short stuff even though he's six feet tall <laughs> whenever we run into george Gervin, it's hey short stuff 
Oh, that's <laughs> funny. Imagine being having George Griffin be your workout buddy. Boy, that would make me go work out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My dad was never in better shape than during that time period. <laughs> I can see why. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, you mentioned LaMarcus, and of course, in Portland here, uh, he was super important to our franchise for quite a long time. So we'd love to find out how he's doing and, you know, how's how's his relationship with the fan base and just how are things going with LaMarcus? Uh, it's actually going really well. It got a little hazy there after those first couple of years because he kind of had a down year in 2017, but that was pretty much overshadowed because that was Kawhi Leonard's MVP-esque season and they had a franchise record 67 wins but he and LaMarcus had had some knee and heart issues that season so that was a tough season for him and while while a lot of people have heard that you know he went to pop and demanded a trade that's not really what happened he you know he went to pop to talk about how he doesn't feel like he's fitting in the system well and, you know, the talk of like, you know, do you think I should be traded? Is that what's best for me and for the team? And Pop was like, you know, no, you know, we're going to work together and make this work for you. And um, and they talked it out in the last two seasons. He's been absolutely amazing the entire time. They, the Spurs playoff streak would definitely be over if it wasn't for him. It probably would have ended last season and would, I would guess, they wouldn't be making it this season either without him. And I think another thing that really helped LaMarcus gain a whole new level of respect from Spurs fans is after seeing what all went down with Kawhi Leonard, because, you know, as we know, and it was well reported last year, Aldridge went to pop, talked it out. They both figured out what was best and, um, and it has worked well for the Spurs. On the other hand, Kawhi spent most of the last season away from the team rehabbing in New York, and they would try to call him to check on him. He wouldn't answer. At one point, some Spurs representatives went to New York to check on him, and his group ushered him into another room and hit and made him hide until the Spurs reps left. Oh, and, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot that the regular media won't tell you about it, but – um and then finally, when the season was over and, you know, Pop is a new widow, he missed the end of the playoffs with um, after losing his wife, unfortunately. But he got right back to work trying to work things out with Kawhi and had a meeting scheduled with him in New York, went there. Kawhi never showed, rescheduled in San Diego. Pop went to San Diego. Kawhi never showed. And then that was it. And then he was... Uh, traded to Toronto. So in a lot of ways, the way LaMarcus worked things out with the Spurs compared to how bad it ended up going with Kawhi, who wouldn't even meet with them and just dodged them. I think that gained LaMarcus a whole new level of respect with Spurs fans. And right now it couldn't be any better. What, um, what did you hear? Like when LaMarcus, you know, came to San Antonio left Portland, what did the fan base kind of talk about in terms of like, what did they know about what LaMarcus's relationship with Portland was like? And, you know, how, how did they think that he fit into San Antonio when he came? Um, I think everyone thought he would fit well. I mean, he is a Texan. He went to nearby university of Texas and there are a whole lot of Longhorns in San Antonio, unfortunately, for this Texas A&M Aggie. <laughs> but, I mean, I've got Chris Middleton and DeAndre Jordan. I can live with them having well, Marcus Aldridge and Kevin Durant. But, <laughs> but um, so, I mean, a lot of fans were familiar with him, even from his college days. I don't think anyone really felt he was leaving Portland out of spite or anything. I think it was just like, oh, we present a better chance to – win a championship and and LaMarcus had said that he very much wanted to play alongside Tim Duncan for a season and I actually think that's the only reason Tim Duncan didn't retire one season earlier is he's like okay I will stay if it if it brings LaMarcus and um so yeah I mean I think everyone thought it would be a very good move that would 
ex, you know, just keep on extending that championship window. And I'd say he just, he's played his role in doing that. What, what at least briefly has closed it is Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, that was a that was a tough one for me. I loved Lamarcus when he was in Portland, and mm. one of the things that I loved about him is that you know there was a there was a point where it was Lamarcus, it was going to be Lamarcus and Brandon Roy and Greg Oden, and they were going to be ama- amazing, and I have no doubt that they would have been had they remained healthy and stayed together. But unfortunately, that wasn't what happened. Brandon Roy couldn't play, Greg Oden couldn't play, and LaMarcus was the one who was left holding the bag. And at that point, what was in the bag wasn't super great. <laughs> so he he really, like, and he, I don't believe that I ever saw him claim that he was, you know, wanting to be this great leader or anything. Like, he just wasn't that kind of personality. He was just, like, a guy who just quietly went about his thing tried to lead by example, but never like had this big outgoing, like leader type personality. So I always thought he got a little bit of a, of a bad rap um, in terms of like, you know, he, he wasn't a leader. He claimed he wanted to be a leader, but then he got mad when Damian Lillard came in and I don't, that was kind of the storyline here. And I don't know how much that, that really was true, but I was really sad when he left because I really did like kind of that, that quiet, lead by example, no matter what the conditions are, you play hard and you play through it and you do your best for your team. And I thought he always really had that attitude. So it was really hard for me when he left. I was um, clinging to hope that he would stay. And I remember that 4th of July morning, looking at my phone going, Mm -hmm. that was it. I I didn't want it to happen, but I knew it was going to happen. Um, that having been said, I may have booed him a few times, but I've, I'm done with that. <laughs> I just had to get it out of my system. <laughs> well, if it's any consolation, we had to go through the same thing last summer with Kawhi. So we, we now know how you feel, and I'm sorry. <laughs> well, so we and, didn't get anybody yeah. back. <laughs> that is true. We've, we've done well with what we got back. <laughs> Well, and kind of my question is, is like at this point, whose team is it? Like, is there somebody who's like the heart and soul of the team now? Um, is it Lamarcus's team? Whose team is it? That's actually really tough. It, it it almost feels like everybody's team at the moment, which is both a good and a bad thing. Like I said, Patty Mills is really the heart and soul of the team from a personality and and leadership standpoint, but there's kind of only so far a role player can carry the load. And I mean, DeMar DeRozan has good leadership qualities, but he is brand new to the organization and was still a little shell shocked when he got here, but he's come on well. I mean, Pau Gasol was a good leader, but wasn't playing much. And we just bought him out uh, last week. So at the moment, it's kind of, I would say it's Pop's team, but they're they're working really hard to change that, I guess, is a way to look at it. It's just a matter of everyone coming together and figuring it all out. And, and like I said, that's hard to do with like eight or nine new players on the team. Mm-hmm. But it, on the court, it's LaMarcus's team, definitely. Uh-huh. If you had to guess among some of the younger players, who do you think might be um, a candidate or some of the candidates? Um, DeJounte Murray is definitely one of them. He he has been sorely missed this season. He tore his ACL in the uh, preseason. I think he only played about one and a half games. And uh, I mean, he was second team all defense last year. He's got the personality and leadership qualities that, pop absolutely loves and he was supposed to take you know a a big leap to near all-star form this season and unfortunately it got cut way too short with the acl tear but i think he is definitely a leader of the future um another one is uh possibly Derek white he's our second year guards drafted in the first round in uh 2017 didn't play much last year. He did what most rookies do and bought his time in Austin playing for the G League, but did very well. And once DeJounte Murray was out, then he had to step up to be starting point guard. 
at least after he got back from an injured foot at the beginning of the season, he has also been very good. He is that quiet lead by example type. He doesn't say much, but he does amazing things on the floor. So, um, and then of course we have last year's first round draft pick, uh, Lonnie Walker, the fourth, who is picked 18th and the highest they've picked since Tim Duncan. If you ignore the fact that they traded for Kawhi Leonard at 15th, but, um, He's also a really good kid and like the others is biding his time in Austin, but he has a lot of promise for the future. So it, even though this is very much a, a rebuilding season thing, the future is definitely looking bright. So the Blazers and the Spurs are going to be playing each other in San Antonio um, on Saturday. And I'm wondering what do you think we should be watching for? Um, well, one thing to note is, You won't see the Spurs that you saw when they visited during the rodeo road trip because this team is just night and day at home versus on the road. Mm -hmm. And another person who was missing from that that rodeo road trip matchup was Derek White. And even though probably no one's heard of him, he is the Spurs' best perimeter defender. He's their best ball handler. He's his shot is really coming on. He hits a lot of big shots at big times. So. He's definitely something to watch. He, he's your latest Spurs diamond in the rough. Like, where did he come from and why is he so good type of guy? Yeah. And Pac-12 fans are going to, would probably know him, I would think. He came yeah, out of Colorado. He yeah. He's Colorado. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other storylines or players we should be extra special to watch out for? Um. Yeah, I mean, DeMar DeRozan is definitely coming on. He started he started the season really strong, but was playing like the third most minutes in the NBA through December just because DeJounte Murray was out, Derek White was out, and that definitely eventually caught up with him in January and February. He just, he looked gassed. His uh, pop was saying he wasn't 100%, but fighting through it. And while this was... He did not make the all-star team this year. I think that was a good thing. He's looked very much rejuvenated since uh, the all-star break ended. He's coming back on. And what you're seeing in the Spurs current winning streak is instead of getting a good game from LaMarcus or DeRozan and having to hope the role players pick up enough slack for one of them, that they can get the win, you're now getting good games from both of them simultaneously. And that's made a huge difference in the last few games. So now you got to accommodate both of them. <laughs> um, does, uh, how much of a presence is Becky Hammond and like, how, um, how is she a part of the team? I mean, like how's things going with her as part of the team? And are there any like stories about her that um, would be of interest? Um, it, it's definitely going well with her. She keeps moving right up Pop's coaching chart. She's now sitting right next to him on the bench. You can see her uh, drawing up plays during timeouts when uh, I don't think Pop's missed any games this season, but in the but he missed some last season. I think he had a few minor health issues earlier in the season. And sometimes a Tory Messina would be the acting head coach. Uh, so I think once or twice it was Becky Hammond and she does a really good job. She's highly loved here in San Antonio. She was amazing for the silver stars and led them to their highest points here before they moved to Las Vegas. And um, she, she's very much a role model for all women here, not only in San Antonio, but just all over the sports world. And if nothing else, you should follow her on Twitter. She's really an amazing person. Yeah, that's so cool. I just tonight watched a, a video that they posted, or I'm not sure who posted it, of her through the years, you know, um, of just of her years playing. And it was just cool to watch her. She has a she has a lot of she's real animated and she gets real pumped up and she has some crazy moves underneath the basket. And it just seems what a cool person to have on the coaching staff. Um, I mean, does she do like in Portland, they do interviews like at halftime or whatever. They always talk to one of the coaches, you know, is she out there doing those kinds of interviews and everything? Uh, usually with the Spurs broadcast, they just quote, talk to one of the assistant coaches as they're coming back out, but it, it's not actually on camera. 
Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's Becky Hammond. Sometimes it's a Tori Messina. They're kind of playing similar roles as co-head assistant coaches. Uh huh. Yeah. No. I one of the things I say about the Spurs, like when I. In kind of in comparison to Golden State is people talk about the dyna- the dynasty of Golden State. And to me, I don't see something as a dynasty until it is turned over and remains just as successful. And so that's mm-hmm. where I always bring out the example of the Spurs. Because in my opinion, the Spurs are a dynasty because they just keep turning over and remaining successful. And, you know, Pop has been there so long. Do you think that the Spurs might do something like have a coaching dynasty or legacy, um, you know, where somebody who is in that position, like is being groomed for the head coaching position. Does that seem like something that they would do or that pop would do? Uh, it really does. A lot of people think that he's, uh, grooming Messina and, uh, Becky and, uh, you know, every, every year Tori Messina is doing, um, interviews for other head coaching jobs. So it kind of feels like he might be out by the time pop retires. And at the same time, I mean, while Becky Hammond hasn't gotten any NBA head coaching offers, she has had interviews and she has had, uh, head coaching offers for, from college basketball that she has turned down. So I I think she very much wants to stay with the Spurs. And a lot of people do think Pop is grooming her to be his successor, whether that's accurate or not. There's no way of knowing because we're talking about Pop. But yeah, I hope so much. That's true. Oh, that would be amazing. That would be super amazing. Well, do you have any questions for us, Marilyn, about the Blazers? Any burning questions about them or like, you know, what we might be watching for? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I always, whenever the Spurs and Blazers play, you almost never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I know we, we just have a, a nightmare of a time winning in Portland, but, um, and I mean, if we were to somehow meet at the playoffs, I truly wouldn't know which way it would go. I, I would lean towards Portland just because of the home court advantage and the whole road Spurs issue this season. But I mean, how, how do you think that would go based on what you know about the two teams? Cassie, do you want to go? Um, I think I would definitely, I would go with Portland this season. And I think with the addition to, cause I don't think we've seen you since we've added Cantor. And I think that's going to be an interesting matchup to watch for this coming weekend. Cause I think sometimes we were having problems with, um, well, Marcus down there at times, and it would be nice to see Cantor kind of step up and step up to the role, but I would love to see the series. I think, Pop can always coach to this level that brings greatness no matter what's happening. And I, I love watching Pop coach. So I, I would love to see it. How about you, Tara? Yeah, I think in a seven game series, I'd like to think that this is where all the stuff that we've been hearing about continuity would mm-hmm. pay off for the Blazers because, you know, you've described Marilyn, the, uh, the team as still very young and still finding their way with not a lot of playing time together. And I mean, the Blazers are, they've, the the team has looked remarkably similar for the last like three seasons. (laughs) And even though uh, none of the playoffs recently have been particularly memorable, um, they do have those extra minutes on the court together and they have really fantastic chemistry. So their biggest thing is that they just have nights where nobody can get a bucket to save their lives. Yeah. (laughs) They got everything else in place, but they can't shoot. (laughs) And it's just like, once they can figure out how to do that, once it starts going in and when it does go in, it is such a great thing to watch. But, um, so I'd like to think that just their experience on the court together in a seven game series would, um, would win out, but it'll be interesting to see Marilyn, what do you think is behind the massive discrepancy in the Spurs road and uh, and home record this season? Is that something that's typical of the Spurs or is that kind of an anomaly? Uh, it's an anomaly, but it's in line with last season when they didn't have Kawhi Leonard. That last season was actually the first season under Pop 
outside of that 96, 97 season where they had a losing road record. And in fact, the season before that, they had set a franchise record with something like 33 road wins. So it's been a big fall from being road warriors to what they are now. But I think a lot of it, again, is just the youth, the unfamiliar, the unfamiliarity. And again, that was, that's a big place where you miss the big three. They could, they put on the same performance, whether it was on the home or the road. They were so used to doing it together. They knew how to get it done. And um, now it's just, you know, a bunch of players who are still getting to know each other and aren't familiar. And um, the other main difference I see in the Spurs on the home versus the road is usually Aldridge and or DeMar, DeMar DeRozan are there for the fight. What usually happens is the role players don't always come along. Like they shoot Patty Mills, Davis Bertans, Marco Belnelli shoot lights out at home, but they don't always bring it on the road. And so a lot of times it's just the lack of help from the role players that hurts the Spurs on the road. So I just thought of something else that might help the Spurs a lot at home. What's with all the wildlife in the arena? I have no idea. I I can't (laughs) say that San Antonio is right on the edge of the Texas Hill Country where there are many caves, some of the largest populations of bats in the state and even the country. And I think sometimes they just stray away a little bit in the AT&T Center. And a lot of people believe there's that tunnel that the players and staff drive in under the arena and park and go in and they're probably hiding under there somewhere. Who knows? It makes sense. I mean, yeah, that seems like a a good place for them. But I remember a few years ago when Thomas Robinson found a snake in his locker. True. Yeah. Yeah, That may have been left over from the rodeo. I mean, it would have to last there a few months, but you never know. (laughs) Oh my God. That's gosh. That's so funny. Well, it has been super fun talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us and telling us how things are going with the Spurs. Could you, uh, do you want to tell people how they can find you and your work online? Uh, Definitely. You can find me on uh, poundingtherock.com, which is the Spurs SB Nation site. Um, I'm also on Twitter. My handle is at AlamoAggie08. And I'm, I've only been on Twitter about a year and a half. I'm still catching on, but I'm tweeting more and more, usually during Spurs games. So that's a good place to find me. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, good luck this weekend. You know, hope still hope the Blazers, you know, come out with the win. But it's been great to learn more about the Spurs and this team. And, you know... I just I love hearing from other people about their teams and how much they love their teams, just like we love our team. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to do it for this episode of Women's Hoops and Talks. You can find me at TCB Biggs on Twitter, and you can follow the Hoops and Talks podcast on Twitter at Hoops and Talks. You could also send us an email. Uh, The email address is hoopsandtalks at gmail.com. Please write to us and let us know what you think and let us know if there's anything you would like to hear about or if there's any women out there that you think we should talk to. Cassidy, would you like to take us out of here? And you can find me at Cassidy Gemmett, C-A-S-S-I-D-Y, G-E-M-M-E-T. Thanks for joining us this week and we hope you have a good one. Go Blazers! Go Blazers!